welcome to this Easter morning. I don't know if you have the tradition here that's been around for a long time. Maybe you do. Actually, the first words I was supposed to say was, Jesus Christ is risen. And he is risen indeed. So <laughs> that's typically the response. So that's a little bit scattered. So Jesus Christ is risen. Getting there. Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Indeed he has. Thank you. Keep them going there. Should we make announcements? If you want to make announcements, this is probably a good time because it says here welcome in announcements. <laughs> well, you're doing that, just glad to be here to, uh, this Easter day to uh, uh, share worship with you. And, uh, it's probably going to continue by the sound. Thank you, Paul. I just have one very quick one, and that is uh, Tuesday is book club. Tuesday, book club, 1 o'clock, back in the fellowship room. Good morning. I would like for the search team to please meet for a few minutes after church. And I have tickets if anybody's looking for them for Arts and Events 817. Our next concert is the first Saturday in May, and the charms are going to be performing. Just for anybody giving announcements, speak right directly in front of the microphone, otherwise we can't hear it. If any of you listen to the service after, uh, like I do, uh, Please speak right into the microphone if you're too tall, like Danelda. It makes a lot of difference if you talk up here than if you talk down here. Hi, my name is Irene. I'm kind of looking around to see if other people want to announce these things. But uh, April the 12th to Friday is a lunch out, I heard. There's a sign-up sheet at the back. There's still one more Sunday before the 12th. Um, you saw here that Drew Gregory is playing on Tuesday at the Hope Church, 1.30 to 2.30. I'm sorry it conflicts with the book club every two months. Drew Gregory and the Hope Bridges team, right, group. It's a free concert for an hour. And, uh, oh, one more thing. We're looking for a coordinator for the <coughs> stupid buns. Just speak to our team if you like to coordinate soup and bun. <coughs> It doesn't mean doing the work, it just means making sure the sheet gets up there. It's a shortage of calling somebody. Um, also, the candles, it came up in council that the candles, we started lighting them early in the service during COVID, I mean after COVID, well, the end of COVID when we restarted services. And apparently, if they're lit all through the service, they some of them get so hot they explode. So if we could, if people could light them later in the service, like when we used to light them, if you don't want to get close, well, just towards the end. I mean, somewhere in there. After communion. Uh, okay, today. Well, I mean today, people didn't know today. So that's just for the future, and tomorrow, next week, there'll be people that don't know either. Uh, just as today, there's people not regularly here, and I don't know if you've heard, but Paul has agreed to be a half-time minister for us. Um, Uh, the search committee continues their work and interviews, and Rosemary Ingraham and Lee Spice will come and fill the Sundays. He's not here, mostly. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, again. I didn't take yours. <laughs> UCW ladies, this is the, uh, the April 6th week that we go to Chester Bear for the big uh, Chinook wins. Um, day uh, of enrichment there uh, with great speakers and it's very important for the future of UCW. Also, because we have Paul with us and guest ministers coming and going, it's very, very important that we all learn to wear our name tags. We've gotten a little bit out of the habit of doing it and I think Paul would appreciate knowing who we are and we need to know who each other is because not everybody does. They're on the, the board at the back. Please don't take them home. Put them back on the board after.
after the service. If it's sitting at home on your dresser, uh, please bring it back to the church and wear it. And if you don't have a name tag, please see Sharon White. She's standing up right here in the front pew. Please see her. She's the name tag maker. And we want everybody to have one for Paul's benefit and for all of us. So please do that. And also this morning, we have the pleasure of celebrating three special birthdays. It was Aurora's birthday yesterday, and tomorrow it is Laura Bakken's and Jean Strixman's on April the 1st. So we're going to sing happy birthday to three of our people. Sorry, sometimes we leave people out. So how about anyone who has a birthday this week or this month put their hand up? Because we don't know everybody's birthday. And of course, some are going to be all right. It doesn't matter that I can't see you, but I can see I can see some shadows waving. All right. So happy birthday then to everyone.
read before I, I take some liberties with scripture uh, sometimes in terms of uh, getting an interpretation, a personal interpretation that, that speaks to me or as I let the uh, passage speak to me particularly in Psalms. And uh, today this one's based on uh, Psalm 118. I certainly won't do anything on the whole thing because I think it's over 150 verses long. <laughs> Interesting psalm if you want to go through it. But usually in worship it's done in bits and the readings for today were from verses 1 and 2 and then 14 to 24 if you want to look that up. Um, and this is how I hear it. Give our good creator gratitude, faithful, loving kindness without end. Let us all say, faithful, loving kindness without end. Faithful, loving kindness without end. My strength in using it for good comes from God's faithful, loving kindness. Bring, they bring deep healing profound gratitude for God's persistence and patience through struggles, severe yet not deadly, always inviting, calling, pleading, into kinship, right relations in all relations, always present when I call, seek, pray, God's presence. Though rejected by those building other altars, empires of misplaced worship, God's response is healing, mending, mending brokenness, remembering, remembering our shattered pieces on this cornerstone, faithful, loving kindness without end, this day, gift of God, we are raised up, new life, rejoicing, and be glad. And we pray together. We are here, gracious God, aware of new life all around us, while also soon bursting forth into majestic flowers.
Well, it comes time to speak to the child in all of us. And uh, sometimes that move is, uh, that movement is started by the, going from the sublime, like that nice song, to somewhat a little more ridiculous. But, so that's what I thought. I, I personally believe everyone has a sense of humor if they're uh, careful enough to find it, aware enough to search it out. Anyway, this story caught my attention. Partly because I heard it a long time ago, and so maybe, maybe you've heard it many times before and already know the punchline, but bear with it anyway. So, once upon a time, there was a man who was peacefully driving down a windy road, and suddenly a bunny skipped across the road, and the man couldn't stop. He hit the bunny head on. The man quickly jumped out of his car to check the scene, and there, lying lifeless in the middle of the road, was the Easter Bunny. Uh, yeah. The man cried out, Oh no, I've committed a terrible crime. I've run over the Easter Bunny. And he started sobbing quite hard, and then heard another car approaching, and there was a woman in a red convertible, and she stopped and asked what the problem was. The man explained, I've done something horribly sad. I've run over the Easter Bunny. Now, there will be no one to deliver eggs on Easter, and it's all my fault. The woman ran back to the car, and a moment later she came carrying a spray bottle. She ran over to the motion bunny and sprayed it from head to toe. The bunny immediately sprang up and started running away, and then stopped and turned around and waved, waved at the man and woman. And then, when another little distance down the road turned around, stopped and waved, and then another just kept going until it disappeared from sight. <coughs> did this, it was just continuous. They couldn't see him. Once out of sight, the man turned to the woman and said, what, what was this stuff in that bottle? And she replied, it's hairs for me. <laughs> It says right on the book, if I pass his hair, and that's a permanent way. <laughs> so sometimes the movement is, in worship is from the ridiculous to the sublime, so we're going to turn to scripture. <laughs> Someone is appointed, there we are. <laughs> Our, our scripture, the story from John. Um, just so you're aware, I, I think most people have noticed that most of the three of the Gospels have uh, stories about um, the day after uh, Jesus was died, the days after Jesus died, but the Gospel of Mark doesn't. And in this year in the lectionary, we're focused on Mark and the last words in. The oldest reading we have of the Gospel of Mark says that after the um, that the disciples ran away in fear after Jesus died, and then there've been a couple of endings uh, tacked on for those who couldn't stand that kind of spiritual tension. And uh, but then when we got to the Gospel of John, which was written uh, towards the uh, well, I think the beginning of the of the, the, uh, the next century, the the one hundreds. So John chapter 20. Yes, John 20, verses 1 to 18. <clears throat> Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter <clears throat> and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, Where have they laid him? And Peter <clears throat> and the other disciple set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw that the linen, linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, 
following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen, linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that the <coughs> told them that they had said these things to her. <clears throat>
question for the day for you to think about, and that is simply what kind of resurrection do you believe in? Or do you believe in the resurrection? Some people do, some people don't. And whether you do or whether you don't, what difference does that make in your life? Just something to ponder. As uh, I talked a little bit about um, some of the traditional understandings of, uh, of resurrection. In the New Testament, um, it is basically the New Testament is a response to the clash uh, between the Empire of Rome and what's come to be called the Kingdom, not the Kingdom, but the Kingdom of God, which was what Jesus uh, promoted in his lifetime. Rome initially seems to have won simply by getting rid of Jesus, as the Roman Empire did. Um, Jesus was charged with being a king and a god, or claiming that he was. And uh, we know kind of from the stories that were told about him, it was pretty trumped up charges in some ways, um, but enough uh, to convince the Romans to, to bring uh, Jesus before Pilate and uh, have a hearing of sorts. The problem with that, as Rome would have seen it, was that uh, Rome had an imperial th theology all its own, and that imperial theology said that uh, the emperor, um, and it, this was very new in the empire of Rome's day, it went from Julius Caesar, who was a republic, into uh, his uh, basically stepson uh, Octavian, who became Augustus Caesar. I uh, don't have to remember all that, it's not in the text. Um, but still, um, what happened was that um, Octavian, or Augustus, raised his father and stepfather uh, up as uh, the, a god. He claimed that, that uh, Julius Caesar had ascended into heaven and become one of the gods. Uh, the, I used the word heaven, but it was related to you know, where the gods were. That's where the, em the emperors were too rise. And um, as, as part of that, um, all the emperors after that, so at least starting with Augustus, were known as King of Kings and God of Gods. You may have heard that phrase before, um, but that's what was common, uh, were common titles, um, and was even written on the coins that were published by the Empire, um, Augustus, son, Augustus, son of the god Julius. Right. Um, it was right there. And of course, Jewish people in, in biblical days as now do not accept that there's any god but one god, one god that is supreme over all, not one emperor that's supreme over all. The Roman Empire maintained their belief uh, through violence as they kept order and stability in the Roman Empire for 400 years by getting rid of all resistance and, uh, and, and opposition to them. If there was an uprising, everyone, the leader, uh, from the leader on down to the lowliest spear bearer or whatever, uh, would have been uh, crucified. And in fact, when Jesus was just a couple of years old, there was such a rebellion in Zephyrus, which is a nearby town, and they literally um, crucified so many people lining the road from Jerusalem to, um, to Rome with crosses of crucified uh, resurrectionists. Um, and they did that until they ran out of wood. It was a very, very brutal, repressive times, and claiming to have an alternate kingdom or another way of uh, running the empire uh, was simply not uh, permitted at all. You were just simply done away with. You do not mess with Rome. Okay? 
Okay. Um, now, if because there's always people who, who fantasize themselves as the, the savior of the world, you know that, that uh, you know it's a form of mental illness. People go around, you know, you see them on the street corners in the city sometimes, you know, proclaiming that they're they're the new messiah kind of thing. Uh, and that was happening a, a lot back then because it was very turbulent times. And um, when there was just one person like that who didn't seem to have any followers, then uh, they would simply crucify that person. And crucifixion was the, the way chosen because it was torture. And they would leave the crosses standing up just like billboards that essentially said, as I mentioned, don't mess with Rome. So Jesus was crucified solid, in a solitary way. Uh, as he told his disciples to put their swords away, don't rise up. Now, he essentially put his own life on the line in order to save their lives. Anyway, you've all heard the, um, you know, the, the story of how that happened. Um, so the resurrection, the experience of the presence of Jesus being alive and dwelling in God, or in us, is actually God's last laugh on the Roman Empire. Um, I'm probably not academically correct in any single way of this. Uh, I've never researched it or looked further, but I did notice that in the word hallelujah, the first two letters are H. A. Ha! Ha to you, Rome. Yeah. You thought you did again. But, but, that's God's great, but something else is happening. And that something else went on to transform not only the Roman Empire, but um, even though it's become distorted down through the ages, but still transforming individual people and groups of people in miraculous ways. There's a problem with the gospel stories. Not, not, there's more gospel stories than just the ones that are, the four that are in the New Testament. There's others like the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of Judas even, uh, that have been dug out of the sands of uh, the Egyptian desert and whatnot. Um, None of the gospel accounts actually tell us what happened between the time the tomb was sealed and its emptiness was discovered. Uh, John Dominic Crossan, a church historian, a former Catholic priest, but he, um, he calls it the great omission. You know, you've probably heard of the great commission, which tells people to go forward make disciples of all people. Uh, but this, he says, is the great omission because um, there is no mention of how the resurrection happened. And of course, wherever there's a bit of a vacuum and, and artists and poets and musicians step into the, the vacuum and try to find a way of expressing what, what we don't know but what we sense. And so uh, artists in the first centuries um, started drawing pictures of the resurrection. And if we could have the first slide there. Um, this one that actually is a little little later than the first century, but it, it, uh, it's one that I found that, that actually encapsulates what uh, is typical among them. And so you see here um, Jesus obviously coming out of, of the tomb. And um, down here are the sleeping soldiers. And um, it, yeah, it's a little, little dark there, but the, the rest of it is this uh, sort of addition to fill it out. But the, uh, except for the Crusader's cross up here, that managed to sneak in. That's what shows it's a slightly older picture, uh, probably around the time of the Crusades. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a very solitary experience for Jesus. Right? And uh, that's, that's the significant part. That's called the, the Western view of the resurrection. So if we could have the next slide, please. 
This is the Eastern view, um, what we now call uh, like Greek Orthodox and Ukrainian Orthodox and Russian Orthodox. Uh, these all, they all got the start with what was all one Christianity at the time, up until 1000, 1000 AD, but uh, they had their own version of this. And you can see it's pictures kind of crowded. And so you have Jesus in the front. There's even a couple of angels floating around up here. Um, but Jesus is uh, has someone by the hand. And down here is the pit, Gehenna. That's what they call, uh, what came to be called um, a hell. Uh, but it wasn't hell in the day. It was simply the the pit where people who died went and uh, waited for the resurrection to happen. And so in the, in the, or for the end of the world to happen really, when they would all be raised up. And so you have down here some demons and there's also some torture instruments and things like that. Um, those came in a little later too. But this is Jesus pulling Adam up out of, uh, out of uh, hell and over the pit. And these are the gates down here. These are little look like covered panels, but they're uh, the gates of Gehenna. And then you have other uh, folk over here, and some of them are, are uh, just uh, prophets and uh, other supportive people and whatnot over here. Uh, you have uh, David. David has a beard. Solomon doesn't because he was younger, apparently. Uh, Moses is in there. Anyway, there are different people, and this is uh, how they saw the beginning of the resurrection of the whole world. So it isn't the resurrection in Eastern thinking was not that resurrection, and even in, in Jude Jewish history or theology itself, the resurrection was never. Uh, thought of as being one person going to heaven. It was everybody going to face final judgment. And that was um, quite common up until um, the Romans got uh, involved through, through Constantine and things got more and more Romanized and uh, Greek uh, philosophy crept in there as well. And anyway, long story short, um, the Western view of uh, solitariness has stayed with us. We still look for an individual to come back to save us. Uh, we still look to um, something material. I always think whenever I hear people saying, oh, the, red, the aliens are going to come back and, and rescue us and all that. Yeah, we just long for the material uh, resurrection. That material salvation that um, is something tangible that we can get our hands on. And yet, we have this other very spiritual thing that says, you know, there's something happened that Jesus, according to Paul in his, one of his letters, Jesus actually is the firstborn of the new creation. He's the new Adam. He's the one who started the resurrection. Uh, and so since then, the resurrection has been underway. As I guess people are taken up in their thinking. We can think of these things differently, that's not important. But what really strikes me is that the kind of division that actually split the church in two between Eastern uh, Orthodox and, and uh, Western, uh, what we just call Christianity, the Holy Roman Empire, all that kind of thing, is very, very sharp, you know, it, it, it broke the church in half. And uh, yet we know that it's not a sharp division. And indeed, some of the art that comes a little later towards the Middle Ages uh, has the two traditions of art uh, melded together. So we have both the solitary Jesus, but also the um, the other people that he was saving. So there was a time of blending, and um, that's important because I think if we're going to ever 
have any kind of unity. We have to find a way of linking our stories so it's not just we have this story and we're right and we have this story and we're right and then we fight about it. Right? And that's been going on for as long as people have been around. It's a division that's often exploited by manipulative people and organizations and government who want to divide so they can conquer want to divide us so we can conquer, they can conquer us. And um, once they've conquered us, they take off with the spoils, the money, the votes, the power, the celebrity, whatever altar they worship at is uh, what is taken from us. And, uh, the, the counter to that, I found, is whenever there's been manipulation, whether it's people or corporations or governments or whatever, the one thing they're really threatened by is, is unity and people getting together and standing up and saying, no, this is not going to happen. Unified groups, especially who believe in something other than themselves. It was Margaret Mead who said that, uh, never doubt that a small group of people uh, can organize and change the world. Um, they always have. <laughs> so, and when you think of the disciples and their impact on spreading the word of the resurrection and the teachings of Christ, um, it has transformed the world and people are still trying to break that transformation part and belittle it and put it down and get rid of it don't crucify people anymore, but they sure do attack them in the media and everything else. Anyway, I just want to make a, uh, a, chair, a quote from the artist Judy Chicago, who uh, had a very famous work called The Dinner Party, and she was, when she was um, explaining what it was about, or talking about it, uh, she made this, this quote, and I think it might help us to transition from the resurrection experience to the communion experience that we're about to have. So it's her vision of a transformed society, no longer empty but, full, but filled with inclusiveness and justice. Here's what she said, and then all that has divided us will merge, then compassion will be wedded to power, then softness will come to a world that is harsh and unkind, and then both men and women will be gentle, and then both women and men will be strong, and then no person will be subject to another's will, and then all will be rich and free and varied. And then the greed of some will give away to the needs of many, and then all will share equally in Earth's abundance, and then all will care for the sick and the weak and the old. And then all will nourish the young. And then all will cherish life's creatures. And then all will live in harmony with each other and the earth. And then everywhere will be called Eden once again. That may sound very Christian <coughs> to Judy Chicago, it's actually Jewish, uh, but so was Jesus, and so were the disciples, and that kind of thinking fed them as it can feed us at this table. Today, in the presence of the empty tomb, empty death, we share in the resurrection feast which Jesus gave us. It is a feast in which we both celebrate and yearn for a transformed world. A world where emptiness is filled, where wounds are healed, where justice, compassionate justice, justice, inclusive justice prevails. As we share in this sacred meal, may we remember that it is up to us, for without us, it simply will not happen. ways than we can imagine. And so we're going to sing the day of resurrection. Voices united. Um.
peace. He shared the anguish, pain, possibility, and faith of his ancestors. He shared fully the human condition. In changing water into wine at the wedding feast, he gave us a symbol of life in all its vitality, abundance, and joy. As your children together, we give you thanks and praise for God. At his supper, last supper with his friends and followers, Jesus took the bread.
Jesus, remember me.
and live out our faith in you as you live out your faith in us. So we pray in Christ's name. Amen. We move into a, a, a brief prayer, I think, a pastoral concern, and maybe we could just begin that by singing or listen to your children praying. Voices you might have for him.
communities, our families, our places of work. As we strive to be your people in our own lives, may we be an inspiration to others, and may they know in us an invitation to participate in the resurrection. May the peace of God be with you this day and always. Amen. May the God of hope go with us.